All right, guys, so I'm going to read from The Pig Man, and I'm going to do chapter two now. So I need you to follow along in the book while I read it aloud. Chapter two, page six. I should never have let John write the first chapter because he's always he always has to twist things subliminally. I'm not panting, and I'm not about to have thrombosis. It's just that some very strange things have happened to us during the last few months, and we feel we should write them down while we're, they're fresh in our minds. It's got to be written now before John and I mature and repress the whole thing. John doesn't really curse that much, and I don't think he needs his system. But even when we were in Mrs. Stewart's typing class, he had to do something unusual all the time, like type a letter in the shape of an hourglass. That's the kind of thing he does. And as you probably suspected, the reason John gets away with all these things is because he's extremely handsome. I hate to admit it, but he is. An ugly boy would have been sent to reform school by now. He's six feet tall already, with sort of longish brown hair and blue eyes. He has these gigantic eyes that look right through you, especially if he's in the middle of one of these his fantastic everyday lies. And he drinks and smokes more than any boy I've ever heard of. The analysts would call his family the source problem, or say he drinks and smokes to assert his independence. I tried to explain to him how dangerous it was, particularly smoking, and even went to the trouble of finding a case history similar to his in a book by Sigmund Freud. I almost had him convinced that smoking was an infantile, destructive activity when he pointed out a picture of Freud smoking a cigar on the book's cover. If Freud smokes, why can't I? Uh, Freud doesn't smoke anymore, I told him. He's dead. Another time, I got my mother to bring home a pamphlet about smoking in which they showed lungs damage from tobacco poisons. I even got her to borrow a book from a doctor which had large color plates of lungs that had been eaten away by cancer. She's a nurse and can get all these things, but nothing seems to have an impact on John, which I suppose brings us right back to his source problem. Actually, we both have families you wouldn't believe, but I don't particularly feel like going into it at the moment because I just ate lunch in the cafeteria. It was Swiss steak. That is, they call it Swiss steak. John calls it filet of gorilla's heart. Also, you'll find out soon enough that John distorts when he isn't out and out lying. For example, in Problems in American Democracy the other day, Mr. Weiner asked him what kind of homes early American settlers live in, and John said, tree huts. Now, John knows early American settlers didn't live in tree huts, but he'll do just about anything to stir up some excitement, and he really did set off those bombs when he was a freshman, which, when you stop to consider, sort of shows a pattern, an actual pattern. I think he used to distort things physically, and now he does it verbally more than any other way. I mean, take the cricket, for instance. I mean, Miss Ryland. She's across the library watching me as I'm typing this, and she's smiling. You'd think she knew I was defending her. She's really a very nice woman, though it's true her clothes are too tight, and her nylons do make this scratchy sound when she walks. But she isn't trying to be sexy or anything. If you could see her, you'd know that. She just outgrew her clothes. Maybe she doesn't have any money to buy new ones or get the old ones let out. Who knows what kind of problems she has. Maybe she's got a sick mother at home like Miss Stewart, the typing teacher. I know Miss Stewart has a sick mother because she has me mark some typing papers illegally and drop them off at her house after school one day. And there was her sick mother, very thin, and with this smile frozen on her face, right in the middle of the living room. That was the strange part. Miss Stewart kept her mother in this bed right in the middle of her living room, and it almost made me cry. She made a little joke about it, how she kept her mother in the middle of the living room because she didn't want her to think she was missing anything when people came to visit. Can you imagine keeping your sick mother in a bed right smack in the middle of the living room? When I look at Miss Ryland, I feel sorry. When I hear her walking, I feel even more sorry for her because maybe she keeps her mother in a bed in the middle of the living room just like Miss Stewart. Who would want to marry a woman who keeps her sick mother in a bed right in the middle of the living room? The one big difference between John and me, besides the fact that he's a boy and I'm a girl, is that I have compassion. Not that he really doesn't have any compassion but he'd be the last one on earth to show it. He pretends he doesn't care about anything in the world, and he's always ready with some outrageous remark. But if you ask me, any real hostility he has is directed against himself. 
The fact that I'm his best friend shows he isn't as insensitive to homo sapiens as he makes believe he is, because he might as well know I'm not exactly the most beautiful girl in the world. I'm not Venus or Harlow, just ask my mother. You're not a pretty girl, Lorraine. She has been nice enough to inform me on a few occasions, as if I didn't remember the first time she ever said it. But you don't have to walk about stoop-shouldered and hunched. At least once a day, she fills me in on what one more aspect of my public image, like, your hair would be better cut short because it's too kinky, and you're putting on too much weight, and you wear very, your clothes funny. If I made a list of every comment she's made about me, you'd think I was a monstrosity. I may not be Miss America, but I'm not the abominable snow woman either. But as I was saying, it is a fact that John has compassion deep inside of him, which is the real reason he got involved with the pig man. Maybe at first John thought it, of it all simply as a way of getting money for beer and cigarettes. But the second we met the old man, John changed, even though he won't admit it. As a matter of fact, it was this very compassion that made John finally introduce himself to me and invite me for a beer in Moravian Cemetery. He always went to Moravian Cemetery to drink beer, which sounds a little crazy, but it isn't if you explore his source problem a bit. Although I didn't know John and his family until two years ago, when I moved into the neighborhood, from what I've been able to gather, I think his father was a compulsive alcoholic. I've spent hours trying to analyze the situation, and the closest I've been able to come to a theory is that his father set a bad, bad example at an age when John was impressionable. I think his father made it seem as though drinking alcoholic beverages was a sign of maturity. This particular sign of maturity ended up giving his father sclerosis of the liver, liver so he doesn't drink anymore, but John does. I had moved into John's neighborhood at the start of my freshman year, and he and a bunch of other kids used to wait for the same bus I did on the corner of Victory Boulevard and Eddy Street. I was in a steer, severe state of depression the first few weeks because no one spoke to me. It wasn't that I was expecting the boys to buzz around and ask me out, but I was sort of hoping that at least one of the girls would be friendly enough to borrow a hairpin or something. I stood on that corner day after day with all the kids, and nobody talked to me. I may believe I was interested in looking at the trees and houses and clouds and stray dogs and whatever, anything not to let on how lonesome I felt inside. Many of the houses were in interesting as far as middle-class neighborhoods go. In fact, I suppose you'd say it was the multi class neighborhood because both the houses and the kids range from wrecks to rich. There'd be a lovely brick home with a lot of land, and right next to it there'd be a plain wooden house with a posted stamp sized lawn that needed cutting. The only thing that was completely high class was the trees. Large old trees lined most of the streets and had grown so tall and wide they almost touched. I loved looking at the trees more than anything at first, but after a while even those started to depress me. Then there was John. I noticed him the very first day mainly because of his eyes. As I told you, he has these fantastic eyes that take in everything that's going on. And whenever they came my way, I looked in the other direction. His eyes reminded me of a description of a gigantic Egyptian eye that was found in one of the pyramids I read about in a book on black magic. Somehow, an archaeologist's wife ended up with this huge stone eye in her bedroom, and in the middle of the night it exploded and a big cat started biting the archaeologist's wife's neck. When she put the lights on, the cat was gone. Only the pieces of the eye were scattered all over the floor. That's what John's eyes remind me of. I knew even from the very first moment I saw him, he had to be something special. Then, one day, John had to sit next to me on the bus because all the other seats were taken. He wasn't sitting there for more than two minutes before he started laughing. Laughing right out loud, but not to anyone. I was so embarrassed. I wanted to cry because I thought for sure he was laughing at me and I turned my head all the way to so the only thing I could see out the window of the bus was telephone poles going by. They called that paranoia. I knew that because some magazine did a whole article on mental disturbances, and after I read the symptoms of each of them, I realized I had all of them. But most of all, I had paranoia. That's when you think that everybody's making fun of you when they're not. Some extremely advanced parano paranoiacs can't even watch television because they think the canned laughter, laughter is about them. Freud would probably say it started with my mother picking on how I looked all the time, but no matter how it started, I've got to admit that when anyone looks at me, I'm sure they're noticing how awful my hair is, or I'm too fat, or my dress is funny. 
So I did think John was laughing at me, and it made me feel terrible. Until finally, and the psychiatrists would say this was healthy, I began to get mad. Would you mind not laughing, I said, because people think I'm sitting with a lunatic. He jumped when I spoke to him, so I realized he wasn't laughing at me. I don't think he even knew I was there. I'm sorry, he said. I just turned my head away and watched the telephone poles some more. Then I heard him whisper something under his breath, and it was just the tone of a first-class smart aleck. I am a lunatic. I made believe I didn't hear it, but then he said it again a little louder. I am a lunatic. Well, I wouldn't go around bragging about it, I said, and I was so nervous I dropped one of my books on the floor. I was mortified picking it up because it fell between the seat and the window, and I was sure I'd look like an enormous cow bending over to get it. All I could think of at that moment was wishing one of his eyeballs would explode and a nice big cat would get at his neck. But I managed to get the book and sit straight up with a real annoyed look on my face. Then he started that laughing again, very quietly at first, and boy, did it burn me. And then I decided I was going to let out a little laugh, so I did. Then he laughed a little louder, and I laughed a little louder. And before I knew what was happening, I couldn't stand it. So I really started laughing, and he started laughing. And we laughed so much the whole time. Uh, the whole bus thought we were out of our minds. 